Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Is that, are we on? We're working. This is good. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, Andrew. Nice to hey, see you again. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Good, good. How are you? Good, good. Cool. All right. Well, um, I guess let's uh, let's kick this off. You know, tell me, what's your name? Where did you come from? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh, your, we're, we're here talking about um, the future of food and so on and drink, of course. Um, your role at, at Perno Ricard is the Director of Commercial Advocacy. Um, yeah. Can you take us through like what that means? What does yeah, that cover? I sure can. <laughs> Get that question a lot. I think even from my parents yeah, sometimes I, wondering what, what I Very even serious <laughs> title. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say it, it probably comes down to about three, um, three key aspects and components of, of my job. And I think you know, the first one is um, we have a, a team of activation specialists and you know, their goal in a, in a non-COVID-19 world of sorts is to, you know, kind of sell, activate our brands within the on-premise, you know, bars, clubs, hotels, restaurants, et cetera. Um, you know, their job is to really win those last three feet, which is the menu, making sure you see our brands on the back bar, um, you know, ensuring we're on specials and features. I think nowadays we've kind of pivoted a little bit and had them, you know, working in the off off premise side of it as well and build some relationships there. And you know, their their main goal is is building on visibility, velocity, and availability of, of our portfolio of brands. Um, the second aspect of, of my job is overseeing um, our brand ambassador program. So um, this includes, you know, all the brand ambassadors across our portfolio who. But I would say, you know, they serve as the face of the brand they represent. Um, you know, it's making sure that, you know, everyone's educated on our products and on our brands and being that, you know, education expert and point of contact for consumers, for retailers, distributors, for, you know, bartenders and staff. And th the main goal of them is to not just be experts on their own um, brands, but, you know, for example, our our agave ambassadors, you know, they, they know Avion, Altos, Del Maguey, but they also know about the whole agave category. So they're, they're able to educate across all aspects of it and, and super knowledgeable and, and just there to really bring the brands to life from an educational standpoint and, and really being able to serve as the face of those brands. And then the, the third uh, part of my team is, is the education of mixology, which is, which is probably the, the funnest uh, part of my team, um, led by Kevin Dent and Jane Danger, who have, you know, tons of knowledge and experience across the industry. Um, you know, they're helping develop drink strategies for our brand teams and working with consumers and, and national account partners, such as, you know, Applebee's and Chili's and some of these national and regional accounts and developing drink strategies and helping them come up with cocktail solutions across the board there. Um, you know, they're also working on selling tools for the field, whether it's um, menu guides and home bar guides for the off-premise to leverage and, and really developing selling tools and education platforms that can be used to educate our own teams internally as, as well as externally to um, the whole hospitality industry and consumers. Um, and then finally, what they work on is uh, a big initiative that we have is, um, is Bar Smarts, which is our online educational program. And, you know, definitely saw a large impact uh, and growth in that throughout COVID um, as people kind of, you know, pivoted more towards um, home drinking and really wanting to be more knowledgeable and really, you know, having, having more of an understanding about the spirits they're consuming, as well as, you know, bartenders and waitstaff wanting to be more educated and, and using that platform as well from that side of things. Yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds very cool. And I, obviously I, you know, my, my company and yours work together. I'm, yeah. I'm very familiar with Bar Smarts. I, I love it. Uh, I think it's very cool. And as a, a home would be mixologist or you know, yeah. <laughs> studying mixologist. But um, can can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like how it how it came about, how long it's been going? Yeah, we've. Um, I think it's been since like 2008. I think was like the first year. Um, you know, the platform was was kind of brought together, and mm -hmm. I would say, you know, it's it's probably it's an online bartender education, and um, it was it was the first of its type from a supplier standpoint. Um, you know, we have like 120,000 people globally that have registered. 
about 40 or 50,000 um, that are certified Bar Smarts graduates. Um, so we, we partnered, you know, back then in 2008 with um, the Beverage Alcohol Resource Group. And, you know, they're a group of brand agnostic, spirit category experts, very history forward, and, you know, worked on this program with them and, you know, authors, educators, bar owners, and industry mentors um, that helped write that curriculum and really develop all of the knowledge behind it. So it's, it's an online, you know, portal, um, has, you know, tons of information on there, written modules, um, chapters on like instruction and how to make drinks and video demonstrations. And, you know, you get tested as you go and then there's a drink builder and, you know, pre COVID times, there was a, a live advanced version of it as well. Um, that we used to do live where you would, you know, you kind of, you're in a room and you're, you're making these drinks in front of some of these industry experts who are then grading you and deciding, uh, whether you pass or fail. So definitely it could be a little nerve wracking for some, but, yeah. um, I think around that we've really seen a massive uptick in it. Um, during COVID, like I said before, because everybody's wanting to know more and be educated more. So I think now what we've realized is there's a whole world of not just hospitality, but consumers um, yeah. that are interested in this. And I think now we're looking for ways to continue growing that program and, you know, continuing to make it fresh and new and innovative um, and really, you know, finding ways to, to give more knowledge around the industry, not just, you know, obviously our portfolio, but making sure people are knowledgeable across the board. Is it, does right. that, well, does that give a good breakdown yeah. of, of what it is? Got, yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I think especially it's, it's kind of, I guess, a, well, a silver lining that it's kind of given it a bit of a, a new potential purpose, or it's maybe sort of accelerated some, uh, some home effort some home drinking efforts and, and things like that yeah so the, i kind the of spike, the spike was out of control it was like we, you know the, the site actually was like crashing at points because we had oh, so really? much so many people going towards it dur during that time frame but it's all fixed now it's <laughs> been fixed it's ready to go for those of you that that would like to join it cool and yeah i mean as you know as as you, you mentioned the pan i guess we should we should kind of hear about your experience there like how 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 was it for your business overall and then for the for the various teams that you oversee um can you take us through kind of how the last 12 months have been for you uh, yeah i feel like i need to take a deep breath you know as you say that i'm sure everybody else you know within the yeah. industry and on this panel can can say the same thing i mean it's it's definitely been the most challenging part i think of everyone's career um but in a good way um and, you know, you see our team, how they've become so agile. And like I mentioned, our activation specialists being able to, um, you know, shift from just call, calling and working specifically for the most part in the on-premise to also being able to lend a hand into the off-premise side of it um, and really be able to kind of grow our business there, build relationships and, and, and help make sure that, you know, our brands were best positioned there, um, you know, everyone's kind of rallied our ambassadors have had to have have gone from you know being these these larger than life personalities of just being in bars and that's where they shine and that's what they're used to it's their work environments so almost being a, a fish out of water and not being able to be around people and not be yeah. able to do that and, and really pivot towards man i hate that word really really shift towards uh doing things online and doing things over zoom um, you know, I think the other, the other aspect has been, you know, the health, health and safety for our team, you know, like they, they've had to do all sorts of protocols that they're probably not used to, you know, all of a sudden everything in a bar and restaurant is socially distant. I don't, I don't think that's something that any of them were used to and, you know, making sure our customers and our consumers are all, you know, having health and safety at the forefront and, um, you know, from a HQ level working with, you know, local officials and coordinators to make sure we're adhering to like any guidelines that they're kind of doing. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, obviously um, sustainability has been such a big driver for everybody, but now it's like we've had to shift to single use vessels, um, you know, and RTDs and, and, and different types of innovation. And like I mentioned before, that, that real shift to off premise and, you know, making sure we're, we're priced right, um, our shelf standards are up to par and, and, and we can keep up with the demand that, that's been going on in there. And then I think from a digital and e-com perspective, we've had to pivot and change drastically, um, you know, making yeah. sure the right bottle images, descriptions, you know, 
right information about our brands and that people are educated the right way there. And, you know, digital initiatives of throughout the on-premise, you know, we did staff meals where we were providing um, meals for, you know, hospitality workers that were out of work, um, you know, and then same thing for bar smarts, no cost for, you know, anyone that was out of work and setting up yeah. QR codes and online menus and, um, you know, just doing everything we can from an on-premise perspective, because it's definitely been the hardest hit aspect of the industry um, yeah. to make sure we can do anything possible to help them, with, you know, with to go drinks, to go food, outdoor dining, all that stuff. So, you know, it's really been different. And, and I'd say, you know, the ambassadors and the specialists specifically have done a great job of being able to shift their thinking and, and really change the way they have worked over the last 12 months. So tell me about that. And then the, um, the ambassadors, like how, I mean, I, what you've said really rings true in, in terms of every sort of brand ambassador I've met, super outgoing, life and soul of the party, you know, they're fairly nocturnal, people you know like people who feed off the energy of people all of a sudden that that's gone um very different very specific skill set very different kind of restrictions um how like how have they been sort of continuing to do their jobs sort of remotely or without um bars being able to either be fully open or partially open or to go only like what's yeah, I think I think a lot of patients uh, on their end, and you know they they're they they're dying to get back into bars and you know in, in a safe way and be back around people. And in some markets, you know, we're able to do that following the local guidelines and making sure all the health and safety is there. But you know, yeah. a lot of their interaction has gone from like face to face to more of what we're doing right now virtually. And you know, it's it's definitely a challenge when you're going through and doing tastings and. Um, you know, you, you, they feed off of the energy in the room and they feed off of interaction and they're, they're personable. So it's definitely been a challenge and shift, um, from how they've done it. But I think, you know, the key takeaway or the key pivot we've noticed is, you know, we're doing more stuff with the ambassadors and consumers now. Um, and I think we've seen how impactful it is now from a consumer standpoint, we've always, you know, we always have and always will continue to have a large emphasis on, on trade and the hospitality industry. But um, consumers are a lot more interested now. You know, they want to know what's in these spirits. They want to know what's in cocktails. They want to know how to make them. Um, you know, they want to be able to talk about it um, in an educated way. So they want more information and they're, and they're feeding that off of these ambassadors and, and watching them do partnerships with, with liquor stores and do, you know, virtual tastings where, um, you know, they're walking them through things and, and they're also telling them about the category and, and, and the number of questions and the number of engagement from consumers, I think has been, has been mind blowing for everybody, um, to kind of watch that. But I think, um, you know, the virtual side of it has also opened up some doors where, you know, we can, you can take a national account and, and do everybody all at once virtually and be able to do an impactful education. Yeah session from that sense. And, and I think that was, that was almost like a foreign thought in everybody's mind beforehand. And now it's like, it's gotten so normal that it's a way that we can really impact and, and really be able to, you know, hit a such broader art audience this way. Um, but again, still making sure once things reopen in a safe way, we're, we're getting them back into the on-premise and, um, you know, being able to have more interactions and, uh, you know, yeah. less of as great as this is right now chatting with you, you know, we'd much rather be at a bar having this conversation, you know, in front of people. And thousand percent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, and, and, and that all makes a lot of sense. And I think that's a really interesting topic on um, like learnings and things from the pandemic that will survive or evolve or, you know, be retained, like new behaviors, yeah. new ways of doing things that actually are either better than before or just a in this case like maybe a, a solution which you know was was never required but actually is serviceable and, yeah. and can work in the mix of you know more in-person things and, and can bring you know scale for example for sure um so yeah to, what do you think about that like what do you think in in terms of like the the things that i guess the ways that that you and your teams have been pivoting and surviving and and you know and reinventing you know the way that you do business like how yeah. which of those do you think is, is gonna are gonna stick around 
Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of different things. And I, if, I'm, if I'm talking about the industry as a whole, from a hospitality standpoint, you know, I'll go on record saying it. I, I think it's the most create, creative, you know, industry that's out there. And I think you've seen that during this time frame. People have gotten so creative and so resilient, um, building outdoor spaces and igloos and all yeah. sorts of different, you know, contraptions. Um, you know, I've seen in New York City, there's a, a place that has tents that's um, absolutely amazing that they're able to build this stuff like outdoors and really go through it. And um, the creativity is out there. And I think that'll always remain um, within our industry. Um, in terms of our specifically, I think, you know, like I mentioned before, bar smarts and the need for that at home education, the need for consumer education and you know, how they become more knowledgeable. That's something we definitely want to continue to focus on is, you know, the, the consumer side of it um, in terms of a lesson we've learned. But I think from the on-premise side of it, you know, you look at QR codes and um, I think that, that's another thing that nobody really ever thought of. And it was out there, but it yeah. wasn't as, it, you know, it was when you get a menu handed to you in a, in a bar and restaurant, you know, it's, it's your first sign of engagement and your first sign of interaction you know with that place and, and you feel welcomed and you feel at home when they're telling you about specials and when they're telling you about what yeah. drinks on there and the favorites but i think you can still have that but now when you sit down at the table and you have a qr code there ready to go you can scan it with your phone you can bring it up before you know the server's even there essentially and then you can yeah. kind of answer your question i think it's made it a lot easier for bars and restaurants um you know it's safe it's directly in front of the consumer. You know, it allows for changes to food and drinks on the spot. If you run out of a food menu item or, you know, you want to run a certain special, like you can change, you can now change by the minute on there. Um, yeah. So admit, you know, you could literally do things differently every day or night or change your cocktail menu up, you know, um, based on day of the week or whatever it may be. Um, and I think it's also, you know, sustainability like i mentioned before i mean you know less paper being wasted um and you know i think that along with like rtds and different different ways of like consuming um spirits i think and also looking at to-go cocktails which were you know never yeah. never really part of the industry and now it you know in some some places it's it's a it's a whole new type of revenue that's that's coming in there. Um, so I think it's you know you've seen a lot of creativity and innovation. Um, yeah, not just from us, but from you know the hospitality industry. And you know, hats off to all of those uh, bars and restaurants that you know continue. Obviously, it's been a struggle for for everyone, but continue to like just think of new ways to get involved and, and do things differently. Yeah, and I I love that because obviously, like the QR code. I mean. When you talk about innovation, so so often people think about, you know, emerging technologies and like the bleeding right, edge right. of like the future and, and so on. Yeah. And actually it can just be like rearticulating something that's already in front of you for a different purpose. So, yeah. I mean, like the QR code thing to me is really, really smart. It was there. They were there a little while ago. They sort of faded. They became quite uncool. They actually, right. they, they, they were all, they, they remained popular in Asia actually, but yeah. But, in the US and in Europe, they definitely didn't. Um, and, and so that's cool. But then the other thing is, I guess, yeah, about the the to, the to go drinks, mm -hmm. um, not in itself a, a brand new concept, not sort of technology driven necessarily, but still right. a new gap in the market. Um, For sure. And, you know, I, are, you, are you seeing a lot of like any, so just sort of quick side point, but are you seeing a lot of like regulatory changes in terms of like where, in, in different locations like consumers being allowed to sort of drink on the streets take drinks home do things like yeah. that or or do you, uh, will those changes be permanent do you think i mean i think you i definitely have no legal say in any of that so i'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll put an asterisk next to it as i say it but i think um you know a lot of states are being much more open, right? I mean, did anybody ever think we would see New York City having outdoor dining the way they had it this past summer? And I believe they're continuing to do so. So um, I think I think a lot of a lot of states and regulators are a lot more open to it. I know, just like everybody else, things change a mile a minute. So 
don't really know exactly where it stands in each in, in each state, but I think it's it looks like it's stuff. It's something that you know each regulatory state is open to. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, so we talked about innovation and and trends. Like, what do you? I guess now that we are maybe looking towards, you know, I don't want to say anything too too dramatic, or, <laughs> but uh, you know, we things are improving. There's definitely like light at the end of the tunnel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what do you see like the next sort of 12 months looking like? Like, I mean, we've talked about innovation and trends in your industry, like, um, and, and what's going to persist, but like, I guess there's going to be like this sort of transitional period. Uh, like what can you see being more relevant um, as we sort of transition out of like the sort of like pandemic limitations and, and mentality? Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 in terms of like, like also with like innovation or just like and trends or just more like what's it going to be? What do I think like those next twelve months are going to look like? I think I think broadly, yeah. So so innovation trends, other things specific yeah. to to your industry, um, oh. and 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 you know and, and user user behavior consumption. Yeah, I stuff. think I think from from my and my personal perspective is you know, and I'm hoping it, 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 it becomes almost a, a renaissance of the roaring 20s again, right? I think everyone has been yeah. bottled up inside and like nobody would love more than to just be, you know, bellied up next to a stranger at the bar and just having random conversations and just enjoying, you know, sporting games and, and, and crowds and people in obviously a socially distant manner when, when things progress. But um, you know, I think hopefully we're seeing that trend of reopening in a socially distant manner, um, you know, delivery menu options as well, kind of becoming more robust. Um, I think mm -hmm. bars and restaurants are much more eager to, to safely reopen and, you know, give people that, you know, connection. Um, yeah. I think, you know, you'll, you'll hopefully continue to see socially distanced outdoor tables, um, you know, like we said, the QR codes and the cocktail menus, but you know, I think everybody's hope is summer, warm weather, vaccine, much better testing um, can hopefully, yeah. you know, carry us through there from from that side of it. Okay. Um, In terms of thinking now, yeah, sorry. sorry Oh, I was no, gonna I was say, gonna I, move on. I think you weren't finished. <laughs> if you know, I was gonna say, I mean, uh, in terms of like the the next twelve months from like a from like an off-premise perspective and, and, and mm -hmm. trends we're looking at, I think, um, you know, ready to drink um, is, is a trend that's definitely here yeah. to stay with the off-premise. I think every time, you know, you, you go into an off-premise store and how even on-premise stores, um, you see those ready to drinks and, you know, consumers want quality cocktails um, or malt-based beverages, like, you know, they, they want those. And, you know, we've seen, I think the number was like, the RTD category is is still supposed to grow by like 20, I think it's like 22% through 2026, which is like, I think it's almost eight times higher than like the total beverage alcohol category. So it shows how much um, that is going to be a thing. And I think we see an opportunity there to kind of pre premiumize that a little bit, um, yeah. leveraging some of our brands. You know, I think in the last year we launched it was, we had the absolute vodka sodas and cocktails and Malibu Splash, Kahlua, Nitro Cold Brew. Um, yeah. You know, I think we're still in like the early days of seeing how, how each, of one, each of those did. But I mean, we're pretty yeah. confident with, with those brands. You know, it's, it's pretty perfectly positioned to um, meet the customer's desire for that. I think there was um, even, even, you know, you even see people, you know, you see other RTV brands, even in the on-premise now, because people are, drinking them so much. So it's definitely been a, a, a bit of an eye opener there that I think is, I think, it, I think that trend was going to come. I think, yeah. I think COVID pushed it quicker, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Have you, by the way, have you tried the, the Jameson cold brew? Uh, I have, I have. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, I'm a big, you know, absolute Kahlua espresso martini fan. So okay. uh, getting it in a whiskey uh, aspect of it too is even better. And it's, uh, you know, when I'm not, when I don't want to shake up a drink, just throwing that on some ice, um, shameless plug yeah. there, but uh, pretty delicious. No, no, I mean, and, uh, that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mentioned I mean, that. I mean, you know, I, I love it. Um, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's to the, especially if you're as an ice, 
iced coffee year round person like me, it's 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 perfect. Yeah, um, and you just you throw it right in there and it's good to go. Yeah. No, I, I, and that's innovation in, in, in its purest. <laughs> um, okay, so going like now, now we're talking a little bit about brands, like sort of going up a gear in terms of um, like at a company level, like Pano Ricard, like across the whole portfolio, like and, and look at the industry as a whole. Um, can you share any insights into the future, like new things you guys are doing, yeah. new like? markets to focus on innovation initiatives any anything like that really yeah a return think, to sustain, yeah sustainability. I think, <laughs> yeah i think you know i touched on a little bit with with the ready to drink i think that's you know that that's some stuff mm-hmm. we're working on from an innovation perspective um you know i think covid's brought uh to the forefront, I think for everyone that needs to be agile in order to win you, you have to be able to change and and we've always been you know as an industry rapid to change, but even more so now, and it has to be even quicker. Um, and I think that's something we intend to carry with us in, into the future. And hopefully, you know, as the pandemic kind of stabilizes and, um, you know, we monitor all those state by states and the city by cities of reopening, like each each new phase kind of is, is a change in force for our industry and a change in force for our thinking where we have to adapt, you know, at the snap of a thumb to to really make things mm. happen because they're they're happening so quickly. Um, you turn on the news and it's just it changes within within a second. Um, I think you know prior to even COVID nineteen, you know we were really monitoring the the decrease in some of the in in person experiences by by Gen Z and you know the pandemic probably accelerated that also even quicker and you know monitoring that and shift our marketing mix to be where the consumer uh, and the customers are. Yeah, um, I think as a whole, you know, the, the spirits industry has, you know, it's got a real opportunity to kind of reinvent itself, you know, consider these trends, um, define what the future is of the bar and restaurant experience. And, you know, I think for us as an organization, it's it's our responsibility to help, you know, our brands and, and our business partners, you know, throughout retail and, and the on-premise um, succeed in this new world. And, and for those, I probably said it 20 times, but on premises, you know, bars, restaurants, nightclubs, all premise yeah. more stores and all that stuff. But I think that's, you know, that's our responsibility as an organization to make sure we're there for our partners on both sides of that. Okay, cool. Um, thinking beyond, I guess, beyond like you personally, like in terms of like, I guess, what are you, what do you look what are you missing what are you looking forward to um you know i guess from an industry point of view like yeah. um is there anything like events wise that you've kind of been missing out on um you know from a networking point of view i guess also uh any things that you've seen in other verticals or sectors that, that you think are pretty cool like i mean t- you know yeah. just trying to sort of broaden the broaden yeah, the scope sure. For sure. Um, I think in terms of what I'm missing, I mean, I think everyone misses the experiential element of, of this industry and, and yeah. events and bringing our brands to life to consumers. And, you know, like I mentioned before, I miss that basic interaction of going into a bar and, and, and you know, hugging your friends in there and, and you know, seeing familiar faces and, and staff and bartenders that, that you know and that have been, you know, supporting your, your brands for years. And, being able to have that close interaction, um, you know, selfishly, I think as a sports fan and, and a music yeah. uh, music person, I think, uh, man, what, what I would do to be at a, at a live concert or at a sporting event of any sort in person, I think, you know, you miss the energy of when people are together and, and you know, not being able to do that now has definitely been, I think, difficult for, for a ton of people. Um, I think when it comes to, things outside the industry. I mean, I think you've seen some of the most creative marketing, you know, from everybody across the world trying to trying to do things um, differently. And I think, you know, the streaming, the whole streaming world of, you know, the Netflix, the Hulu's, the, you know, Disney Plus, ESPN Plus, like has just accelerated insanely um, to make it so easy for for customers to kind of be able to watch from home. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see, I think as, as, cool, as, as cool as it was to see the shift in companies' mindsets, like as things were changing, it's gonna be even more interesting to watch how, that, how, they, how, how everyone shifts back 
to a, to yeah. somewhat of a new normal, you know, once that hopefully uh, comes about. But to me, that's going to be the really interesting part of, of seeing how things go is because now you have this whole side of it that people have been living in for almost a year um, mm-hmm. of doing everything digitally and online to now shifting hopefully soon back to like being out and about. So it'll be interesting to see how those two kind of balance each other out in the future. Yeah. What do you think? think, um, (laughs) Sorry. I think you see in the stock market as well, you know? Oh yeah. The (laughs) stock market is is wild. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I'm I'm curious to see if that will ever settle or how. Um, I was going to ask about um, delivery services. Um, Again, like obviously a a sort of, you know, they they existed before the pandemic, but of course, Mm shot up in use during the pandemic and yeah. i'm thinking liquor specifically here rather than food you know services like drizzly go cop etc um how do you what do you see their role being sort of post pandemic do you think like that habit of people ordering like hard liquor especially like for for today or for tomorrow will survive um i, I think so I, I think so because i think it's it's you know it all depends on the, the exact consumer, right? I think you have some that are that like going into the store and having that interaction, but then there's other moments where it's like, you know, if you're hosting, you're you're doing so many different things that like, you know, if you can, if you know what classic brands and, and we've seen some, some of our brands like Absolute, Jameson, Malibu, like the, the, the our steady core brands have really had a massive positive increase during, you know, throughout the pandemic because it's easy, you know, if you can just get on your phone have those sent to you and, and it's one less thing that that you kind of have to worry about. So I, I definitely think a trend like that is something that's probably here to stay. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, <laughs> I was uh, I, I was thinking back on the um, on the uh, alcohol delivery side of things, like how I suppose thinking like on premise and off premise and the sort of the blurred lines especially we've seen this in new york where i'm based between food and drink so for example bars being mandated to sell food right um also you know bars probably wanting additional revenue streams um and restaurants you know selling cocktails to go or sometimes even at at shop windows onto the street and so on like how thinking on premise like are you gonna do you think we'll see more of a blurring of lines of um you know where where people are sort of where food and drink are kind of like more intertwined than ever. Yeah, I think you've definitely seen a, you know, so many places, almost a lot of places open up with food as it is. Um, I think, you know, you, you, you know, you, you need that and it's another, it's an extra form of revenue. And I think even more so now, you know, places in cities that have survived and that have done very well, um, they've almost become more of a restaurant than, than a bar at this point, because yeah, Based, based on where you are in what city, I mean, you know, it's most likely following it, those rules and regulations of like, you have to be seated, you have to be, you know, in there. It's, it's almost like a restaurant now where there's yeah, you know, as much interaction there. So I think you're definitely going to see a lot of that um, kind of shift and or not even shift. I think a lot of that you're going to see kind of stay the same, you know, and, and have those both kind of intertwine and continue to grow together and, you um, yeah, just continue to play in that same playing field. All right, uh, we have a question. We have one of our, sure. our first questions so far. And by the way, if anybody's listening or watching, um, feel free to, to chat the questions to us. Um, so how has your investment in media channels changed over the last six months? Asks anonymous attendee. Yep, yeah, um, I think we've definitely seen an increase in that. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I can get get, get that. But you definitely see an increased number of media from our side, especially because we're not, you know, spending as much money like I, or there's not as much in-person experiences as there previously was. So we've definitely upticked the investment on that side of it. Yeah, yeah, that's sure. I, I, you know, personally, and again, we we do this at, at our company at Media Monks, but even just as a consumer, I can't wait for some of the cool sort of physical experiential stuff to right. return, of right. course. You know the liquor industry is responsible for for some of the best right. um and i i think some of the cooler experience i'm also missing the sort of travel retail side of things i mean i'm yeah. missing traveling yeah. travel in general sure. but um 
it's definitely I, I would say some of the sort of the best foot forward that we see from from the spirits industry is in sort of, you know, travel retail, like specifically like duty free spaces. I mean, yeah. they they must have been hurting a lot. Like, can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, I don't, you know, it, it, that that part of our business sits sits separately from from where I am. But, um, you know, I mean, obviously, the, the amount of travel that has decreased, especially international um, mm-hmm. has definitely impacted, I think, probably everybody across the board from that side of it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I think there, there definitely has been a little bit of a struggle there just because there's no, you know, the consumers have have been, you know, almost evaporated to a degree. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Well, you know, I, I, it sounds like there are a lot of positive changes that that will come yeah. from this, and you know, a lot of good things to come. Sure. Yeah. Cool. So, oh, okay. So, <laughs> for some reason, I thought we were at time. I apologize. Uh, oh, here she is. Yeah. Sorry, Pearl. I think I jumped the gun a little bit. And I think you're on mute. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens each time. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for such a great conversation. I wish this was in person. We were at the Pernod yeah. Ricard headquarters in New York City. Yeah, we'd love you guys, to have like, you there. Just had that whole mezcal line by Del McGay and I went to town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, delicious stuff there. Yeah. Um, so as soon as we're back doing in-person events, you'll be the first on my list to call. Awesome. Please do. Please do. <laughs> Please invite me too. Of course. Of course. We got you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we'll hopefully we'll see you guys both back again soon. Awesome. Um, thank, thank you, you. Guys for all the great insights. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have...